Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. I'm honored to be here. It's a testimony to how far Christian Jewish relations have come that a Jewish person is invited to participate in this year of the tribute to the Apostle Paul. I hope my effort will serve to further this development. <clears throat> How's the mic? It's all right. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. The Shema Israel has arguably been the most important ideological claim of Judaism since early Israelite history. This call to listen to God is followed by the injunction to love God, that is, to be loyal and serve with all of the effort one can summon. This call includes both observance and reflection, kavanah, the intention of the heart. It captures the very essence of the Torah, the teachings of God that Israel is, on behalf of all humankind, privileged, but also responsible to listen to and embody. You'll find the Shema and some other texts that I will quote on the handout. If you didn't get one, you can find one in the back. To this day, the Shema Israel is uttered in sacred prayer twice a day. Jewish children learn it as their first prayer, and Jews hope that it will be the last words on their lips. Rabbi Akiva recited the Shema when executed by the Romans, following the failed Second Revolt. Understanding the commandment to loyalty with all thy soul, to signify even if he takes thy soul. And the call to martyrdom continues in subsequent interpretive tradition. The claim that God is one affirms Israel's choice of her God alone or only. And this God's choice of Israel. Regardless of the claims of other nations on their gods, or their gods upon those nations. The natural sense of the Declaration of Deuteronomy 6.4 in its own context is not the denial of the existence of other gods, but the prescription for Israel to only look to her God. It is analogous to a person declaring that a certain mate is the only one for him or herself. Such a proposition does not rest upon denying the existence of other men or women, but affirms in spite of their existence that the one in view is singularly of interest to themselves. The one he or she loves like no one else, to whom he or she will be loyal regardless of the circumstances. Marriage rituals are constructed around just this dynamic. So too is the Israelite conception of the covenant relationship between God and Israel. Although the Shema is mentioned only once in Torah, the redactor of the Mishnah, Judah the Prince, made it the opening halakha for the Talmud. The call to hear is a call to obey. Yet we do not always do as we ought according to what we have heard to be right. Thus the Midrash of Deuteronomy Rabbah reminds that even when Israel failed to do na'aseh, what it ought by making the golden calf, it was nevertheless still responsible to hear, nishma, to listen. The Shema thus includes both the call to obedience and to reflect on the meaning of that calling in spite of falling short of perfection. As Ecclesiastes 7.20 reminds, there is not a just person on earth who does good and sins not. Yet Israel is called, on behalf of all humankind, to attend to the doing of that which is right. Hence the Talmudic expression for the Shema is Kabbalat o Malkum Shemaim, the acceptance of the yoke of the kingdom of heaven. The Shema embodies the ideals of Jewish spirituality. In biblical Hebrew, there is, surprisingly enough, for a religious tradition so attentive to the obligation of obedience, no specific word for obedience, but words such as this one. In English, it's highlighted when a parent rebukes a child with, did you hear what I said? 
This is an ironic turn of phrase from one who knows the child heard it, yet feigns ignorance to rebuke them. It means you did not respect my intentions. Or, in a longer version, do you understand the responsibility to which hearing this by definition committed you to loyally observe as a member of this family? <laughs> Indeed, the sages ruled that the recitation of the Shema is more concerned with understanding than hearing. Thus, while the ideal is to enunciate the Shema with intention, nevertheless, even if it is recited inaudibly, one can fulfill this halakhic requirement. Obedience is intended to express heartfelt commitment to the ideals embedded in the action, even when the heart is heavy or distant. Defining the oneness of God is the subject of a rich interpretive tradition. Deuteronomy 4.39 tells how Moses taught the people to realize today and turn it over in your mind. The Lord is indeed God in heaven above and on earth below. There is no other. Maimonides in the 12th century emphasized that God is incorporeal, indivisible, and completely unique. Rashi in the 11th century, observed that oneness includes the recognition that Israel's God is the only God of all the nations. The Shema became the rallying cry for Israelites in the face of polytheism. The call is to hear, not to see. There is no statue to behold. The sense of hearing involves not only cultivation of one of the senses apart from the others, but also the commitment to that which others have not similarly witnessed. When Isaiah proclaimed that Israel's God declares, I form the light and create darkness, I make peace and create evil, this was a polemical challenge to the regime of the Persians with the two gods of Zoroastrianism, one of light and goodness and another of darkness and evil. Later, this declaration naturally expressed a polemical sense of number in the face of Christian Trinitarian claims. The Shema functions not only theologically, but also socially. It defines group identity and values. Well, by now you may well be asking, why have I come to a Paul seminar? <clears throat> what does all of this Jewish tradition about the oneness of God have to do with Paul? I submit to you that the Shema Israel is the central conviction of Paul's theology. He often refers to God's oneness at critical points in his arguments. It functions theologically and polemically, but he does not really explain the Shema as much as appeal to it, suggesting that for Paul the concept of God's oneness functions at the ideological level. It, its explanatory power is assumed to be self-evident. This is true not only for himself, but his arguments presume it to be the case for his audiences also. Yet that would not work for those unfamiliar with its propositional basis or the importance in Jewish communal life and liturgy. In other words, while most interpreters of Paul and most discussions of a topic like Paul and the Jewish tradition would be concerned to show how Paul emerged from the Judaism of his time, they would do so from a conceptual framework in which Paul is no longer a representative of Judaism, but of a new religion, Christianity. Instead, I suggest that Paul practiced Judaism, and his groups represented a Jewish coalition upholding that the end of the ages had dawned, and thus, that the awaited day when the members of the other nations would turn to Israel's God as the one God of all humankind had arrived. He spoke for a Jewish subgroup that upheld faith in Christ, to be sure. But this was not a new religion, nor did he imagine that it would ever be one. He was a reformer involved in the restoration of Israel and the gathering of the nations initiated thereby. 
If we turn to Paul's letter to the Romans, we can see Paul's direct appeal to the Shema as the basis for his judgment about the standing of non-Jews within the community of the people of God. The text of Romans 3, 29 to 31, which you have, reads like this. This is my translation. We can talk about it in the discussion if you like. Or is God the God of Jews only? Not the God of members of the other nations also? Yes, of members of the other nations also, since God is one. Who will justify the circumcised out of faithfulness and the foreskinned through the faith? Do we then nullify the Torah by the faith? By no means. On the contrary, we establish the Torah. One might expect Paul to reason from the oneness of humankind that we are all one, or to elaborate at least that because God is one, therefore humankind is one, neither Jewish nor non-Jewish. But he does neither of these things. Rather, Paul simply appeals to the logic of God's oneness without explaining it. Paul pronounces a statement that is at once simple and complex, one that for a Jew is almost too close to the bone to be able to explain, because it is self-evident. At the same time, one that is too all-encompassing to ever finish explaining. The discovery of the Shema Israel as central to Paul's theology was a profound moment for me and has shaped my reading of him ever since. If I were writing a theology of Paul, it would be the center around which all the other topics turned. Here we see it employed clearly in a pivotal point in his argument in Romans for why non-Jewish believers in Christ must remain non-Jews and not become proselytes, and by the implication of his logic, why Jews remain Jews after faith in Christ, since God is one. Now, one unfamiliar with Jewish logic based on this oneness of God theme might find it difficult to follow. After all, what does God as one have to do with the warrant for the inclusion of non-Jews? If they became proselytes, that is, Jewish converts, would not God be one? But for Paul, with the coming of Christ to redeem Israel and the nations, the answer would now logically be for him and other Christ believers, no. But why? Because then it would signify that even in the awaited age, God is only the one God of Israelites, including those who join the people Israel by way of proselyte conversion, leaving the members of the rest of the nations turning to God in Christ without a legitimate claim on Israel's God, as if there were more than one. One of the critical questions in Christian theology is the relationship of its members to Jewish identity and behavior, an identity concern which, for the original audiences, supports the claim that they understood themselves to be participants in Judaism, albeit not as Jews. In Paul's time, although no longer, for Christ believers who were not Jews, the first question was whether they could or should become members of Israel, which is accomplished by completion of the rite of proselyte conversion. For males, this includes circumcision. Circumcision, in Paul's language and other Jewish language, functions as a metonym for the rite of proselyte conversion. It's a rite or work or deed prescribed by Torah to become a member of Israel, and thereafter a person obliged to observe Torah that is responsible to practice Jewish behavior. Since the church fathers, the traditional Christian answer to whether proselyte conversion should be undertaken by Christ believers has been a definitive no. The traditional reason offered has been because the time of Judaism and Torah has ended with the coming of Christ. They are finished, at least for Christ believers, and Christians should not, indeed cannot, become Jews or observe Torah as a matter of faithfulness. 
This has been applied to Jewish believers in Christ as well as to non-Jewish believers. It has been universalized so that Christianity has no place for Jewish identity or Torah-defined lifestyles. It's thereby made clear that Christianity is not Judaism. And Jewish tradition has answered that ideological stance in kind, making it clear that Judaism is not Christianity. And they have become very different indeed. Obviously then, when the topic of Paul and the Jewish tradition arises, it does so on the basis of an essential contrast or in terms of Paul's former religion, one that perhaps continues to surface in his life and teachings because of his past, or occasionally when seeking to mimic Jews in order to evangelize among them, but not because he seeks to be faithful to it in his Christian life. I suggest that the traditional approach is anachronistic for Paul and for his contemporaries, including the members of his communities. I understand Paul to teach non-Jews that came to faith in Christ that they cannot become Jews, members of Israel, but for a very different reason. Paul argues, I believe, not on the basis of the passing of Jewish identity or Torah, but on the basis of their role for Israelites in particular, and not for the members of the other nations. In terms of the Shema, Paul is developing the tension between the special privilege of being Israel The Lord is our God, the God of the covenants made with our fathers, versus that of God's role as the creator of all humankind, the Lord alone. God is the God of all the nations in whose service God has called and set apart the people Israel to demonstrate his righteousness and express his loving kindness or grace. Here we meet so-called particularism, and universalism in unison, not as binary opposites as they are so often treated. We can thus understand Paul's sharp denial that faithfulness to God in Christ nullified Torah, but rather the claim that it established Torah. Torah, which means God's teaching, guides Israel to live faithfully to the one God, which includes bearing witness of God's faithfulness to the nations. For Paul, that includes declaring the good news of God's rescue of the nations in Jesus Christ. Paul's argument is consistent with other Jewish interpretations of the Shema not connected with Christ's faith. Consider the language of the Sifra on Deuteronomy 6.4. When discussing why the scriptures say the Lord is both our God as well as one, this redundancy calls for explanation. The rabbis conclude first that our God serves to teach us that his name rests in greater measure upon us, upon Israel, and then offers this interpretation which you have. The Lord our God, that is, over us, the children of Israel, the Lord is one over all the creatures of the world. The Lord our God in this world or in this age The Lord is one in the world or age to come. As it is said, the Lord shall be king, shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall the Lord be one and his name one. Zechariah 14.9 The concern for the universal as well as the particular is contextualized in terms of the awaited future. Israel presently has a special relationship with the one God who is the master not just of Israel, but of all of the other nations too. Similarly, roughly halfway between Paul's time and our own, Rashi explained the repetition of the name Hashem, which is a circumlocution for Adonai, which is a circumlocution for the unpronounceable tetragrammaton. And he explains it like this, and you have this text. The Lord who is our God now, but not yet the God of the other nations, is destined to be the one Lord. As it is said, 
For then will I give to the peoples a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. Zephaniah 3.9. And likewise it is said, and he repeats Zechariah 14.9. The eschatological expectation explains the confession that Israel makes today, but ultimately that all of the other nations will make too. But they do not do so yet. And that is where Paul's argument is based upon the same logic, but to a very different conclusion, because of his understanding that Jesus Christ has brought the dawning of that awaited day. As Paul brings his argument in Romans to a close, he sets out a graphic social portrait of non-Jews joining together with Jews in praise of the one God with one voice that mirrors the language of Rashi, although predating it by a millennium. In Romans 15, 5 to 12, drawing from the Torah, the writings, and the prophets, making it quite conclusive, Paul exclaims, and I have part of this for you, May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the circumcised on behalf of the truth of God. Why? In order that he might confirm the promises given to the patriarchs. And in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Two different reasons. One for the Jews, one for the rest of the nations. Now the quotes I won't read to you, but these basically talk about the Gentiles in the midst of Israel, proclaiming, without being Israelites, proclaiming the worship of the same God. For Paul, if non-Jews in Christ become Jewish proselytes, and thereby Israelites, they do not bear witness to the arrival of the day when the representatives from all of the nations turn from idols to the worship of the one God, but simply to the truth that in the present age Israel represents the righteous ones of God, members of which they become by proselyte conversion. That identity transformation for non-Jews is available apart from the confession of faith in Jesus Christ in most other, other Jewish groups of Paul's time. They provide for proselyte conversion to join the family of Abraham within the present age and await with Israel the hope of the day of reconciliation of the rest of the nations. Then the wolf, such as is Rome, will lie down and eat with the lamb, Israel, without devouring her. But until that time, such behavior would be foolish for lambs to indulge. Yet for Paul, if all who worship the one God are Israelites or become Israelites, then God is only the God of one nation, not of all of the nations. If the non-Jews who turn to Israel's God do so while remaining non-Jews, and thus not members of the nation Israel, then they worship the God of Israel as the one God of the nations also. And that is the point of Paul's argument. No matter how many difficulties this poses for these members from the other nations, and the Jews who affiliate with them as co-members of these Jewish coalitions, God's oneness cannot be compromised. But the members of the other Jewish groups who hope for reconciliation with the nations and expect them to remain not Israel would not agree with Paul that this moment had arrived in the resurrection of Jesus Christ or begun to arrive and be witnessed in the life of the communities of believers in that proposition, unless sharing Paul's faith in Christ. In their groups, the distinction and membership that follows from it remains between Gentiles or members of the other nations however welcome as friends and guests, and Jews, a category that includes proselytes. It is on this matter of where we stand on God's timetable, at the dawning of the awaited day, and thus making halakhic decisions appropriate to its arrival, that Paul 
and other Christ-believing groups were unique, as far as we are aware, among Jewish groups of his time. And that, I believe, was the rub. Saul, Paul sought to proclaim this truth and to bring his communities into conformity with his teachings so that they would exemplify its merits. In his view, it required subordination to the Spirit of God to live in the present age according to the dynamics of the age to come, which is granted to Gentiles in Christ on the same terms as Jews, apart from their becoming Israelites. In particular, the challenge for Christ-believing Jewish communities is to live out the proposition that while difference continues in this age, his audiences are to no longer express the discrimination generally associated with those differences in present age terms. It's obvious now that I do not agree with the view of many interpreters of Paul, Jewish, almost all of them, as well as Christian, probably all of them, that Paul taught the dissolution of differences, that there were no longer Jews and Gentiles in Christ, but a kind of new third race, as some have phrased it, at least since Clement of Alexandria. Paul does write famously in Galatians 3.28, there is not Jew or Greek, and there is not slave or free, and there is not male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Here we see again the theme of oneness. But Paul cannot mean that these identities no longer exist among Christ believers. They are very real biological, cultural, and socioeconomic differences that are not dissolved. Slaves are not by definition freed in these groups. And Jews do not become Gentiles any more than Gentiles become Jews. There remain fundamental biological differences between women and men. And a man has either been circumcised or remains in his foreskin state. Paul recognizes these differences in his arguments. In his letters, he addresses people and groups composed of these different identities specifically, differently, and with different instructions. He explains the world from Israelite-based conceptualization of reality. He does not address anyone as a Christian, but as a Jew or a non-Jew, circumcised or foreskinned. Apart from an Israelite worldview, such categories do not carry meaning. It is only within these categories that being named a loyal follower of Jesus Christ or not arises. Thus his rhetoric must signify something other than the end of difference. Rather, it signals that these different people and groups, although different, are not to continue to discriminate among themselves based on prevailing cultural valuations of those differences as they had previously in the, as Paul calls it, present evil age. They are to live in community, to eat together at the messianic banquet of the awaited age, bearing witness to the propositional claim of the gospel that that age had come, had arrived with Christ in the midst of the present one. That is the truth of the gospel to which they are called. Paul's position in Romans 3 and Galatians 3 is in keeping with his argument in 1 Corinthians 7, 17 to 24, that everyone who comes in the Christ-believing subgroups should remain in the state in which they were when called. Thus, those circumcised remain Jews, obligated to observe Torah on the basis of Paul's own argument in Galatians, that if you become circumcised, you're obliged to observe the whole Torah while those who are not Jews remain not Jews. What is paramount, Paul declares, which may surprise many, is not one's relative social identity or status, but that everyone put first, quote, keeping the commandments of God, unquote. It is hard to believe that this Paul has become the apostle of freedom polemically juxtaposed with the value of faithful action, including the observance of Torah, the champion of faith alone, rather than of loyalty. It should also be recognized that the notions of Christians as neither Jews nor Gentiles, circumcised nor foreskinned, has been settled in Christian tradition in real terms to mean they are not Jews and they are not circumcised. 
Gentile and Christian are conflated in contrast to Jew and non-Christian. This has created a struggle with Jewish identity and behavior, including how, and even in some cases, such as Marcion, whether to use the Tanakh. In sharp contrast to Paul's argument and the implicit logic that God is the God of the Jews, the logic of the Christian abrogation of Jewish identity and Torah-based lifestyles for Jews, as if their role has ended in Christ, is that God is only the God of non-Jews, of Christianity as a Gentile religion. But that turns Paul's argument from the Shema on its head. That God is the God of Jews was the logical premise for the question about whether God is also the God of non-Jews. He argued for the inclusion of non-Jews as equal co-members in the people of God, as children of Abraham but not of Israel, not for the exclusion of Jews thereby. And he argued for the unequivocal continuation of all Israelites in the family of God as beloved, including those who did not share Paul's faith in Christ because of the gifts and promises made to the fathers. Read Romans 9, 4 to 5 and 11, 26 to 29. Indeed, concerned to nip in the bud any potential arrogance toward those presently stumbling Israelites was one of Paul's central messages throughout the letter to the Romans, made explicit in the olive tree allegory and other arguments of chapter 11. There's not time to discuss other texts in which Paul explicitly or implicitly appeals to the Shema, but I do want to at least read two of the most obvious ones that call for reflection. In Galatians 3.20, Paul writes, Now a mediator or the mediator, involves more than one party. But God is one. Figure that one out. And in 1 Corinthians 8, 4-6, Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that, quote, no idol in the world really exists, presumably they've written this to him, and that, quote, there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God. It represents an understatement, to say the least, to observe that I propose interpreting Paul from a more Jewish perspective than is generally practiced in Pauline scholarship. In a title like Paul and the Jewish tradition, the conjunction and would usually serve to mark a contrast between Paul on the one hand, the Christian apostle and founder of a new religion, Christianity, and the Jewish tradition, on the other hand, which he supposedly left following his conversion. While some similarities might be noted, it would focus on how different they were and all the more precisely because of his influence, how different they continue to be. But I maintain that Paul's arguments indicate that he continued to live and teach from within Judaism, albeit from within a specific group affiliation, turning around a shared conviction about the meaning of Jesus Christ. Yet Paul still thought and argued and acted from within the Jewish religious system, appealing to Judaism's ideals and seeking to embody them, and he called for the members of his groups to do so as well. In short, I believe that Paul and his groups practiced Judaism, even though for subsequent generations represented in the tradition known as Paulinism and in the religion that became Christianity, this proposition is so fundamentally out of step with the prevailing interpretations of Paul that it might seem impossible to imagine, reckless, and unable to be maintained. In conclusion, I ask you to consider the following eight dynamics of this interpretation. Long conclusion. (laughs) Number one, Paul supposes that appeal to uh, Judaism's ideals, and in this case the Shema, will carry authority with his Christ-believing audiences yet he does not explain the theological foundations for such an important assertion as the Shema, around which this argument turns. He expects them to resonate with this way of seeing the world and that they will think and behave 
accordingly. Two, Paul was not against, against ethnic or gender or other kinds of difference continuing to be relevant in the lives of Christ believers, including Jewish identity and concomitant observance of Torah. Rather, difference played a role in expressing the fundamental truth of his gospel proposition that the Creator God was not confined to one people or culture. Although the God of Israel, and best exemplified by the righteousness expressed in Torah, the ideals could be expressed in other cultural ways, too. What was not to be expressed, however, among themselves, was hierarchical discrimination on the basis of the ways that difference functioned in their present age cultures. Difference was to remain, but God is one. This particular matter obviously perpetuates the relevance of this interpretation of Paul for Christians today, not only concerning the ethnic category of Jew and non-Jew, but for all relationships that take place across lines of difference, including gender, ethnicity, economic means, cultural norms, location, and on and on. Three, the Shema was a central aspect of Paul's eschatological reasoning, his reasoning about the end of days. For him, the age to come has dawned in the resurrection of Christ. The messianic banquet has begun. Thus, both Israel and the other nations turn to the one God equally. When the Christ-believing subgroups of the Jewish community meet, they represent the demonstration of this propositional truth, or they should. It is from this idea that his specific teaching of Jewish values in cross-cultural terms proceeds. Thus, we find him explaining the theological premises from which they should think, and by which their behavior should be guided. Four, reasoning from these points, rather than from the premise that he regarded there to be something inferior about Jewish identity and behavior, or undesirable about it for Christ believers, or that it was simply obsolete, explains why Paul opposed the proselyte conversion of his non-Jewish audiences. They were, and were to remain, non-Jews. They were thus not to become under Torah, obliged to observe it on the same terms as Jews. At the same time, it follows that Jews were to continue to circumcise their sons and that they were to observe Torah as Jews, including Paul, whom I have argued elsewhere continued to practice prevailing Jewish dietary norms as a matter of covenant faithfulness. Thus the non-Jew, and that will give you plenty of questions to ask, thus the non-Jewish Christ believers were to respect the righteousness embodied in these teachings. Romans 13, Galatians 5, both say that the Torah is summed up in loving your neighbor, not that it's passé. And to respect their explicit practice in the lives of Jews, in Romans 14, for example. Number five, it is the uncertainties and difficulties proceeding from this Jewish utopian ideal that brought about the kinds of social problems for the people in his groups, non-Jews in particular, that he wrote letters to resolve. We thus have a very limited and highly contextualized corpus of literature upon which to construct our portrayals of Paul, as well as our histories of the origins of this movement. For most of his statements, four non-Jews in Christ should be added to retain the specific focus of his teachings in their historical context. The question shouldn't be, what did Paul, did Paul think he could be circumcised? Was he against circumcision? For non-Jews in Christ is the question. Particular care must be taken in moving across the line between the world of Paul and his assemblies and the movement that sprung from them, which became Christianity. Exegesis, or historical-oriented interpretation, and hermeneutics, or contemporary application-oriented interpretation, are both cross-cultural enterprises. Six, this recognition has profound implications for Christian identity, for how Christians look at their own sense of self and ideals for being in the world. Christian foundational truths as far as the voice of Paul is concerned, 
arise from within Judaism, not to oppose it or begin a new religion, but to exemplify its ideals. Granted, within roughly 50 years of Paul's death, Ignatius declared that anyone not named a Christian does not belong to God, and more pointedly, that it is utterly absurd to profess Jesus Christ and to practice Judaism. He says, for Christianity did not believe in Judaism, but Judaism in Christianity, in which every tongue believed and was brought together to God. In other words, an appeal to the oneness of God theme. That this has been the way these religious ideals, including God's oneness, have been developed, should provide reason for pause and reconsideration. If not the probable intended result of Paul's thought and teaching, then when and how this change came about should be the subject of investigation. Instead of attributing to Paul the founding of Christianity as a new religion free of Judaism, perhaps it's time to seek to discover just how and why this change occurred and to reconsider these decisions and their implications. If you're still with me, number seven. Similarly, this historical challenge to the meaning of Paul and the interpretation of Christian origins where his influence is concerned calls for a reconsideration of his voice in Jewish historiography. Jews should become aware of so-called Paulinism, which represents an interpretive trajectory in Christian teaching and thus in Jewish responses that has seldom been separated from the probable intentions of the original apostle. Jews need not agree with Paul to seek to translate his language and its meaning in historical context, including where that might differ from the prevailing Christian translations and interpretations of him, as I have sought to illustrate today. Just as in the study of Jesus, the study of Paul offers data that is important to filling in the map of the Judaism or Judaisms of this critical period during the time just before the final destruction of the Second Temple and subsequent emergence of Rabbinic Judaism. And just as Jesus is studied by Jews as well as Christians attentive to the difference between the study of the historical figure and the religious traditions that emerged thereafter, so too should Paul be studied attentive to this dynamic. Eight and finally, this proposition offers a new way forward for Christian-Jewish dialogue and relations. Today, there are significant differences between these two faith traditions. What stood between these originally Jewish groups continues to be the main difference between these two present-day religions. It is not their foundational ideals, but the meaning of Jesus Christ that is in dispute. The point is not to ignore all the differences that now exist between these two religions, but to get the differences right. This approach provides a way to recognize and seize upon the similarities from which we can work together to bring about mutual respect, and thus a level of much-needed shalom arising from the shared identity in the present age as fellow witnesses to the one God. In spite of different opinions about